Hi, boys and girls. So when we left off with holes at the end of chapter 42, Stanley and Zero were still off by themselves in the desert. And they, um, Stanley was thinking about how he was actually feeling happy and he had never been so happy in his life. And, um, he just was like actually glad that, that this has happened to him and that there was no place he would rather be right now. And so he started kind of daydreaming about, you know, maybe we don't ever have to go back to Camp Green Lake. You know, maybe we can find a way to survive on our own or live, um, you know, go, go, go live off on our own and hide away from the police. And he kind of was just fantasizing about what kind of life he could create for himself. And um, so now at the end of the chapter, he was wondering if maybe there was treasure buried where they were. And so he had asked Zero if Zero wanted to help him dig another hole. So we'll have to find out what happens next. Chapter 43. We weren't always homeless, Zero said. I remember a yellow room. How old were you when you... Stanley started to ask, but he couldn't find the right words. Moved out. I don't know. I must have been real little because I don't remember too much. I don't remember moving out. I remember standing in a crib with my mother singing to me. She held my wrists and made my hands clap together. She used to sing that song to me, that one you sang. It was different, though. Zero spoke slowly as if searching his brain for memories and clues. And then later I know we lived on the street. But I don't know why we left the house. I'm pretty sure it was a house and not an apartment. I know my room was yellow. It was late afternoon. They were resting in the shadow of the thumb. They had spent the morning picking onions and putting them in the sack. It didn't take long, but long enough so that they had to wait another day before heading down the mountain. They wanted to leave at the first hint of daylight so they'd have plenty of time to make it to Camp Green Lake before dark. Stanley wanted to be sure he could find the right hole. Then they would hide by it until everyone went to sleep. They would dig for as long as it seemed safe and not a second longer. And then, treasure or no treasure, they'd head up the dirt road. If it was absolutely safe, they'd try to steal some food and water from the camp kitchen. I'm good at sneaking in and out of places, Zero had said. Remember, Stanley had warned, the door to the rec room squeaks. Now he lay on his back, trying to save his strength for the long days ahead. He wondered what happened to Zero's parents, but he didn't ask. Zero didn't like answering questions. It was better to just let him talk when he felt like it. Stanley thought about his own parents. In her la last letter, his mom was worried that they might be evicted from their apartment because of the smell of burning sneakers. They could easily become homeless as well. Again, he wondered if they had been... If they'd been told that he ran away from camp, were they told that he was dead? An image appeared in his head of his parents hugging each other and crying. He tried not to think about it. Instead, he tried to recapture the feelings he'd had the night before. The inexplicable feeling of happiness, the sense of destiny, but those feelings didn't return. He just felt scared. The next morning, they headed down the mountain. They dunked their caps in the water hole before putting them on their heads. Zero held the shovel and Stanley carried the sack, which was crammed with onions and the three jars of water. They left the pieces of the broken jar on the mountain. This is where I found the shovel, Stanley said, pointing out a patch of weeds. Zero turned and looked up toward the top of the mountain. That's a long way. You were light, Stanley said. You'd already thrown up everything that was inside your stomach. He shifted the sack from one shoulder to the other. It was heavy. He stepped on a loose rock, slipped, then fell hard. The next thing he knew, he was sliding down the steep side of the mountain. He dropped the sack and onions spilled around him. He slid into a patch of weeds and grabbed onto a thorny vine. The vine ripped out of the earth, but slowed him enough so that he was able to stop himself. Are you all right? Zero asked from above. Stanley groaned as he pulled a thorn out of the palm of his hand. Yeah, he said. He was all right. He was worried more about the jars of water. Zero climbed down after him, retrieving the sack along the way. 
Stanley pulled some thorns out of his pant legs. The jars hadn't broken. The onions had protected them like styrofoam packing material. Glad you didn't do that when you were carrying me, Zero said. They'd lost about a third of the onions, but recovered many of them as they continued down the mountain. When they reached the bottom, the sun was just rising above the lake. They walked directly toward it. Soon, they stood on the edge of a cliff, looking down on the dry lake bed. Stanley wasn't sure, but he thought he could see the remains of the Mary Lou off in the distance. You thirsty? Stanley asked. No, said Zero. How about you? No, Stanley lied. He didn't want to be the first one to take a drink. Although they didn't mention it, it had become kind of a challenge between him and Zero. They climbed down into the frying pan. It was a different spot from where they had climbed up. They eased themselves down from one ledge to another and let themselves slide in other places, being especially careful with the sack. Stanley could no longer see the Mary Lou, but headed in what he thought was right in the right direction. As the sun rose, so did the familiar haze of heat and dirt. You thirsty? Zero asked. No, said Stanley. Because you have three full jars of water, said Zero. I thought maybe it was getting too heavy for you. If you drink some, it will lighten your load. I'm not thirsty, said Stanley, but if you want to drink, I'll give you some. I'm not thirsty, said Zero. I was just worried about you. Stanley smiled. I'm a camel, he said. Remember, camels store water and fat in their humps so they can go long periods of time without drinking because obviously they have to survive in the desert. So he's making, um, he's creating a metaphor, which is he is pretending that he is a camel because he is saying that he can handle going long periods of time without drinking water. They walked for what seemed like a very long time and still never came across the Mary Lou. Remember, Mary Lou was the boat that um, Zero had been found in, and the boat, Mary Lou, was um, had belonged to Sam. So hundreds of years ago, back when Sam, the Onion Man, and Kate Barlow were alive, and his great-great-grandfather, Stanley's great-great-grandfather, were all alive, um, Sam had owned this boat, and he named the boat after his donkey. His donkey's name was Mary Lou. He named his boat Mary Lou. And so that's how Stanley figured out that, huh, this boat is where Kissing Kate Barlow and Sam must have been. And so he made that connection there and figured out that this is the area probably where Kate Barlow abandoned his great-great-grandfather and may have left behind some treasure. Okay. Stanley was pretty sure they were heading in the right direction. He remembered that when they left the boat, they were heading toward the setting sun. Now they were headed toward the rising sun. He knew the sun didn't rise and set exactly in the east and west, more southeast and southwest, but he wasn't sure how that made a difference. His throat felt as if it was coated with sandpaper. You sure you're not thirsty, he asked. Not me, said Zero. His voice was dry and raspy. When they did finally take a drink, they agreed to do it at the same time. Zero, who was now carrying the sack, set it down and took out two jars, giving one to Stanley. They decided to save the canteen for last, since it couldn't accidentally break. You know I'm not thirsty, Stanley said as he unscrewed the lid. I'm just drinking so you will. I'm just drinking so you will, said Zero. They clinked the jars together, and each, watching the other, poured the water into their stubborn mouths. Zero was the first to spot, on Mary, spot the Mary Lou, maybe a quarter mile away, and just a little off to the right. They headed for it. It wasn't even noon yet when they reached the boat. They sat against the shady side and rested. I don't know what happened to my mother, Zero said. She left and never came back. Stanley peeled an onion. She couldn't... Always take me with her, Zero said. Sometimes she had to do things by herself. Stanley had the feeling that Zero was explaining things to himself. She'd tell me to wait in a certain place for her. When I was real little, I had to wait in small areas, like on a porch step or a doorway. Now don't leave me here until I get back. Sorry. Now don't leave here until I get back, she'd say. I never liked it when she left. I had a stuffed animal, a little giraffe, and I'd hug it the whole time she was gone. When I got bigger, I was allowed to stay in bigger areas. Like, stay on this block. 
or don't leave the park. But even then, I still held Jaffe. Stanley guessed that Jaffe was the name of Zero's giraffe. And then one day she didn't come back, Zero said. His voice sounded suddenly hollow. I waited for her at Laney Park. Laney Park, said Stanley. I've been there. You know the playscape, asked Zero. Yeah, I've played on it. I waited there for more than a month, said Zero. You know that tunnel that you crawl through between the slide and the swinging bridge? That's where I slept. They ate four onions apiece and drank about half a jar of water. Stanley stood up and looked around. Everything looked the same in all directions. When I left camp, I was heading straight toward Big Thumb, he said. I saw the boat off to the right, so that means we have to turn a little to the left. Zero was lost in thought. What? Okay, he said. They headed out. It was Stanley's turn to carry the sack. Some kids had a birthday party, Zero said. I guess it was about two weeks after my mother left. There was a picnic table next to the playscape and balloons were tied to it. The kids looked to be the same age as me. One girl said hi to me and asked me if I wanted to play. I wanted to, but I didn't. I knew I didn't belong at the party, even though it wasn't their playscape. There was this one mother who kept staring at me like I was some kind of monster. Then later a boy asked me if I wanted a piece of cake, but then that same mother told me, Go away! And then she told all the kids to stay away from me. So I never got the piece of cake. I ran away so fast, I forgot Jaffe. Did you ever find him? It? For a moment, Zero didn't answer. Then he said, he wasn't real. So it sounds like he didn't even have a stuffed animal. He had a make-believe stuffed animal because he didn't even have a real one. So he had to make up a make-believe stuffed animal to keep him company. Stanley thought again about his own parents, how awful it would be for them to never know if he was dead or alive. He realized that was how Zero must have felt, not knowing what happened to his own mother. He wondered why Zero never mentioned his father. Hold on, Zero said, stopping abruptly. We're going the wrong way. No, this is right, said Stanley. You were heading toward Big Thumb when you saw the boat off to your right, said Zero. That means we should have turned right when we left the boat. You sure? Zero drew a diagram in the dirt. And that's his diagram that he drew. Stanley still wasn't sure. We need to go this way, Zero said, first drawing a line on the map and then heading that way himself. Stanley followed. It didn't feel right to him, but Zero seemed sure. Sometime in the middle of the afternoon, a cloud drifted across the sky and blocked out the sun. It was a welcome relief. Once again, Stanley felt that destiny was on his side. Zero stopped and held out his arm to stop Stanley, too. Listen, Zero whispered. Stanley didn't hear anything. They continued walking very quietly, and Stanley began to make out the faint sounds of Camp Green Lake. They were still too far away to see the camp, but he could hear a blend of indistinct voices. As they got closer, he occasionally could hear Mr. Sir's distinctive bark. They walked slowly and quietly, aware that sounds travel in both directions. They approached a cluster of holes. Let's wait here until they go in, said Zero. Stanley nodded. He checked to make sure there was nothing living in it and climbed down into a hole. Zero climbed into the one next to him. Despite having gone the wrong way for a while, it hadn't taken them nearly as long as Stanley had expected. Now they just had to wait. The sun cut through the cloud and Stanley felt its rays beating down on him. But soon more clouds filled the sky, shading Stanley and his hole. He waited until he was certain the last of the campers had finished for the day. Then he waited a little longer. As quietly as possible, he and Zero climbed up out of their holes and crept toward camp. Stanley held the sack in front of him, cradled in his arms instead of over his shoulder to keep the jars from clanking against each other. A wave of terror rushed over him when he saw the compound, the tents, the rec room, the warden's cabin under the two oak trees. The fear made him dizzy. He took a breath, summoned his courage, and continued. That's the one, he whispered, pointing out the hole where he had found the gold tube. It was still about 50 yards away, but Stanley was pretty sure it was the right hole. 
There was no need to risk going any closer. They climbed down into adjacent holes and waited for the camp to fall asleep. Chapter 44 Stanley tried to sleep, not knowing when he'd get the chance again. He heard the showers and later the sounds of dinner. He heard the creaking of the rec room door. His fingers drummed against the side of the hole. He heard his own heart beat. He took a drink from the canteen. He had given Zero the water jars. They each had a good supply of onions. He wasn't sure how long he remained in the hole, maybe five hours. He was surprised when he heard Zero whispering for him to wake up. He didn't think he'd fallen asleep. If he had, he thought it must have just been for the last five minutes. Although when he opened his eyes, he was surprised how dark it was. There was only one light on at camp, in the office. The sky was cloudy, so there was very little starlight. Stanley could see a sliver of a moon, which appeared and disappeared among the clouds. He carefully led Zero to the hole, which was hard to find in the darkness. He stumbled over a small pile of dirt. I think this is it, he whispered. You think? Zero asked. It's it, said Stanley, sounding more certain than he really was. He climbed down. Zero handed him the shovel. Stanley stuck the shovel into the dirt at the bottom of the hole and stepped on the back of the blade. He felt it sink beneath his weight. He scooped out some dirt and tossed it off to the side. Then he brought the shovel back down. Zero watched for a while. I'm going to try to refill the water jars, he said. Stanley took a deep breath and exhaled. Be careful, he said, then continued digging. It was so dark he couldn't even see the end of his shovel. For all he knew, he could be digging up gold and diamonds instead of dirt. He brought each shovel full close to his face to try to see if anything was there before dumping it out of the hole. As he made the hole deeper, it became harder to lift the dirt up and out. It was five feet deep before he even started. He decided to use his efforts to make it wider instead. This made more sense, he told himself. If Kate Barlow had buried a treasure chest, she probably wouldn't have been able to dig much deeper. So why should he? Of course, Kate Barlow probably had a whole gang of thieves helping her. You want some breakfast? Stanley jumped at the sound of Zero's voice. He hadn't heard him approach. Zero handed him a box of cereal. Stanley carefully poured some cereal into his mouth. He didn't want to put his dirty hands inside the box. He nearly gagged on the ultra-sweet taste. They were sugar-frosted flakes, and after eating nothing but onions for more than a week, he had trouble adjusting to the flavor. He washed them down with a swig of water. Zero took over the digging. Stanley sifted his fingers through the fresh, fresh piles of dirt in case he had missed anything. He wished he had a flashlight. A diamond no bigger than a pebble would be worth thousands of dollars, yet there was no way he'd see it. He finished the water that Zero had gotten from the spigot by the showers. Stanley said he'd go fill the jars again, but Zero insisted that he do it instead. No offense, but you make too much noise when you walk. You're too big. Stanley returned to the hole. As the hole grew wider, parts of the surface kept caving in. They were running out of room. To make it much wider, they would first have to move some of the surrounding dirt piles out of the way. He wondered how much time they had before the camp woke up. How's it going? Zero asked when he returned with the water. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. He brought the shovel down the side of the hole, shaving off a slice of the dirt wall. As he did so, he felt the shovel bounce off something hard. What was that? Zero asked. Stanley didn't know. He moved his shovel up and down the side of the hole. As the dirt chipped and flaked away, the hard objects became more pronounced. It was sticking out of the side of the hole, about a foot and a half from the bottom. He felt it with his hands. What is it? Zero asked. He could just feel a corner of it. Most of it was still buried. It had the cool, smooth texture of metal. I think I might have found the treasure chest, he said. His voice filled with more astonishment than with excitement. Really? asked Zero. I think so, Stanley said. The hole was wide enough for him to hold the shovel lengthwise and dig sideways into the wall. He knew he had to dig very carefully. He didn't want the side of the hole to collapse, along with a huge pile of dirt directly above it. He scraped at the dirt wall until he exposed one entire side of the box-like object. He ran his fingers over it. 
but felt to be about eight inches tall and almost two feet wide. He had no way of knowing how far into the earth it extended. He tried pulling it out, but it wouldn't budge. He was afraid that the only way to get to it was to start back up at the surface and dig down. They didn't have time for that. I'm going to try to dig a hole underneath it, he said, and maybe I can pull it down and slip it out. Go for it, Zero said. Stanley jammed the shovel into the bottom edge of his hole and carefully began to dig a tunnel underneath the metal object. He hoped it didn't cave in. Occasionally, he'd stop, stoop down, and try to feel the far end of the box. But even when the tunnel was as long as his arm, he couldn't feel the other side. Once again, he tried pulling it out, but it was firmly in the ground. If he pulled too hard, he feared, he'd cause a cave-in. He knew that when he was ready to pull out, pull it out, he would have to do it quickly before the ground above it collapsed. As his tunnel grew deeper and wider and more, pre and more precarious, Stanley was able to feel latches on one end of the box and then a leather handle. It wasn't really a box. I think it might be some kind of metal suitcase, he told Zero. Can you pry it loose with a shovel, Zero suggested. I'm afraid the side of the hole will collapse. Might as well give it a try, said Zero. Stanley took a sip of water. Might as well, he said. He forced the tip of the sh shovel between the dirt and the top of the metal case and tried to wedge it free. He wished he could see what he was doing. Are you all like wondering right now, what in the world are they going to uncover here? What is this? I am like so curious to find out what's going to happen. He worked at the end of the shovel, back and forth, up and down, until he felt the suitcase fall, through, fall free. Then he felt the dirt come piling down on top of it. But it wasn't a huge cave-in. As he knelt down in the hole, he could tell that only a small portion of the earth had collapsed. He dug with his hands until he found the leather handle, and then he pulled the suitcase up and out of the dirt. I got it! he exclaimed. It was heavy. He handed it up to Zero. You did it, Zero said, taking it from him. We did it, said Stanley. He gathered his remaining strength and tried to pull himself up out of the hole. Suddenly, a bright light was shining in his face. Thank you, said the warden. You boys have been a big help. And that's the end of chapter 44. So, we can infer that clearly the warden somehow knew that they were out there, either heard them or was spying on them, and waited until they dug out this treasure and then chose to catch them in the act. So we'll find out what happens next to poor Stanley and Zero.